Hey, it's Andrew Jenks, documentary filmmaker. Along with my fellow producers, Dwayne Johnson and Danny Garcia, we created the podcast, What Really Happened? We actually hit number one on the Apple podcast charts for season one, which you can listen to right here or download them wherever you listen to your podcasts. Our new presenting sponsor is ZipRecruiter. Looking for your next great hire? You just need smart tools. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 top job boards with just one click. Then their powerful technology finds and notifies the most qualified candidates to apply. That's why 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through their site in just one day. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash W-R-H. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash W-R-H. It's tough when riding shotgun with a bad driver. Nobody wants to tell that person how to drive, but you also don't want to get killed. In this case, imagine driving with a guy who happens to be a bit heated when challenged, who hasn't just racked up 13 tickets, been in six accidents, and once collided with a motorcyclist who went flying off of his bike, but a man who was caught riding down the wrong way of a one-way road. You would, or at least I would, want to speak up, but imagine that driver is Chris Christie. Would he even listen to you? Would he ninja kick you out of the passenger seat? Would he say, Sit down and shut up. Christie's manner of speaking has always caught my attention. In some ways, I've respected it, like during a Republican debate when each candidate talked about their fantasy football team until Christie interrupted with, Wait a second. We have $19 trillion in debt. We have people out of work. We have ISIS and Al-Qaeda attacking us. And we're talking about fantasy football. Early in his career, he was applauded for his brash attitude. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to get in debate. You want to hear the answer or no? Do you want to hear the do you want to hear the answer or don't you? Cuz I'm not going to put I've heard you. Okay. Next question. Go ahead. Yes, sir. And let me tell you something. After you graduate from law school, you conduct yourself like that in the courtroom, your rear end's going to get thrown in jail, idiot. Go ahead. Like the time he walked out of a hearing to catch a train. I had to depart at 1.30 today because of pressing business that I have back in New Jersey. I've been here since 11 o'clock and available. And so I, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I need to go and uh, catch uh, a train, it, sir. He wasn't driving that day. And he did, in fact, make the train. When Christie became governor of New Jersey, which comes with a driver, a security detail, and state troopers whenever in transport, there was a sigh of relief. The roads were safe. Or so we thought. After winning a second term, Governor Christie got caught in a scandal. The story of the scandal, known as Bridgegate, seems fairly simple. A mayor of a small town decided not to endorse Christie in his 2014 bid to win re-election as the governor of New Jersey. Christie went on to win handily, but before he did, somebody, either Christie or his team or some variation of the two, decided to get back at the mayor for not endorsing Christie. The best way to do so? Stir up horrendous traffic to make it impossible for residents of the small town the mayor presided over to get anywhere. It was that simple. Give the mayor a few days or even a few weeks of angry constituents. And the way to create such awful traffic was by closing off a few lanes that connect the town to the nearby bridge. The excuse given to close those few lanes? Simple. Say there was a traffic study going on. Traffic studies are done by the government to better understand traffic patterns and ultimately alleviate traffic. They're common and oftentimes require lanes closing. What makes this story extraordinary is that the nearby bridge this small town connects to is the biggest bridge in the United States, the George Washington Bridge, necessary in connecting the world to New York City. Once it came out that somebody in the Christie administration or Christie himself stirred up this fake study, Christie's downfall began. He went from the front runner for the 2016 Republican nominee to the least liked governor in the country. But Christie hasn't stopped being himself. After losing the Republican nomination, endorsing Donald Trump, and getting caught hanging out on a beach that the government closed, Christie was recently on the radio. He wasn't talking politics or governing, the governor was on sports radio, and people were pissed because he wasn't, well, you know, doing government stuff. Mike and Montclair, what's up, Mike? 
Governor, next time you want to sit on a beach that is closed to the entire world except you, yeah. you put your fat ass in a car and go hey. to one that's open to all your constituents. Uh, well, you know, not just you interesting, and interesting, Mike. You know what? That What's beach, that? that? What's beach, that, Gov? You know, Mike. I love I love getting calls from communists in Montclair. Communists in Montclair. In Montclair. You know, you're a bully, you governor, are, no, no, and I don't what? like bullies. You know what? And listen, I'm not the one who came on the air. Hey, hold on, Mike. Mike. You may have noticed the caller emphasizing Governor Christie as "quote unquote" gov. Although this is shorthand for any governor, Christie's talk like the people approach had constituents at an early point in his governorship, removing the more formal governor, and just began calling him the gov. The nickname shouldn't be a surprise. In fact, many in the Bridgegate scandal seem to have nicknames. The Ghost, Wally Edge, Mr. Wolf, the Little Serbian, the Hammer, the Fixer, the Wild Man, Phony Baroni, and the Road Warrior. While Christie himself has been given a long list of nicknames. George W. Bush called him Big Boy. Bono called him the Primo Donna. High school classmates called him Bullocks. Others more cruel calling him Christie Creamy, the Illsbury Doughboy. Cookie Monster, and when Christie was in Mexico, Letterman called him Cinco de Mayonnaise. The press covered Bridgegate like the world was ending. But the conclusion to this story appears to have been overlooked, perhaps because of other news that took over the media's interest. Legally speaking, Christie either one, ordered this to happen and obviously knew, two, didn't order it to happen but knew, or three, didn't order it, didn't know anything about it. When U.S. Attorney William E. Fitzpatrick left the final day of sentencing, he gave a press conference. Legally, the results were clear. After four years of investigations, two of Christie's aides have been sentenced to prison, and another given probation and other ramifications. Governor Chris Christie was not found guilty of anything. He never spent a day in court. But there is something extraordinary that happened the day the U.S. Attorney left the courthouse, declaring Bridgegate was finally over. After a few brief remarks and then answering a few questions, I could hear just barely in the background a reporter asking if there wasn't sufficient evidence to go after the governor. The U.S. attorney didn't ignore the question. He didn't say no comment, as he did with other questions. He didn't say the governor is innocent. Instead, he said, If we don't have enough evidence to indict somebody, then we don't say anything else, period. But right there, he just said everything. Quote, if we don't have enough evidence? I spoke with different legal minds asking if this sounded like an odd answer, and the answer was yes. The U.S. attorney was not saying, yes, we got the people that were guilty. He was saying, we did the best we could with what we had. It's saying we could only do so much. It's saying the law is restricted by what people are willing to turn over. The U.S. attorney thanked the few reporters there, nowhere near the over 30 journalists that had been covering Bridgegate at its peak. And that was it. But if you think you've heard this entire story, you most certainly have not. I've decided to look back at all of the testimony, articles, books, and reporting, and see if I could form an honest opinion that perhaps the district attorney wasn't allowed to do. I'm hoping to answer the question, what really happened? My name is Andrew Jenks, and this is What Really Happened, where I challenge accepted narratives around key events involving legendary figures. This week's episode is on Bridgegate, a scandal that was reported about ad nauseum, but as all sides of the political spectrum will see, is really a Shakespearean drama about people with conflicting motivations, and in this case, characters that Hollywood's finest scriptwriters couldn't even begin to imagine. Christie sounds like a kid any parent would be proud of. In second grade, he started attending PTA meetings to discuss field trips, When on a youth baseball team, he was the star, winning MVP, and rather than gloating, he apparently wrote a letter to the local newspaper thanking his two coaches. Who does that? When a superstar catcher arrived senior year, Christie was asked to switch positions. His parents almost sued the school, but Christie made the change, became team captain, and got a standing ovation at the end of the year celebration for their state championship. Throughout high school, Chris Christie was class president. He ended up meeting then-President Jimmy Carter. Chris rolled up his sleeves outside of school as well. At the local diner, when the owner kicked students out for not ordering enough food, Chris didn't just organize a boycott. He wrote a letter to the editor of the local paper. 
he handed out leaflets asking everyone to eat in another diner in a nearby town. The original diner's business plummeted to the point where, weeks later, Chris returned to that diner alone, sat at the corner, and negotiated a compromise with the owner. Business was back. By college, he personally lobbied then-Senator Joe Biden to fight against President Reagan's proposed cuts to a student loan program, and Christie set up phone banks for students to call congressmen about important issues. When one of their attempts at change didn't go as planned, Chris told the local student paper that the involvement of his fellow students was, quote, goddamn terrible. He then ran for Delaware Undergraduate Student Congress, and he took it so seriously that even his opponent was shocked, saying, quote, Chris approached it like a professional politician, added the opposing VP, quote, like they had a platform. There was a debate and he wore like a suit and tie. Chris won with 61.7% of the vote. Chris Christie is, for better or worse, an alpha male at the head of the pack. He's certainly no lone wolf, but there is one in this story, which is why I now want to introduce you to David Wildstein, a name you'll hear a lot in this episode. Wildstein is the ultimate lone wolf. Picture Wildstein like Jonah Hill in Moneyball. Wildstein is slightly overweight, wears glasses, and by all indications was and remains obsessed with baseball. Like Jonah Hill, it didn't seem like Wildstein would make the high school baseball team. It's unclear if he even tried out. Now, it's said that when a lone wolf is left alone or pushed away from a group, the wolf will use certain talents to rejoin the group. They will, quote, find and develop a new one if possible. A lone wolf is also one who works alone. They're aloof and emotionally unable or unwilling to directly interact with other characters in a story. A stereotypical lone wolf will be dark or serious in personality. So, unlike the other players that knew they couldn't make the team or didn't make the team, Wildstein didn't try out for another sport or join some sort of school club. He wanted in. What did he realize? He could become the team statistician. So what does this baseball-loving, politically-obsessed, Jonah Hill-looking young man have to do with anything in this story? Wildstein was marking the stats for Chris Christie. They were in the same high school. While Christie was hitting home runs, Wildstein was tallying them up. Both loved baseball and both loved politics. While Christie was at PTA meetings, Wildstein, at seven years old, was handing out campaign literature in support of Hubert Humphrey, Wildstein became a paid political activist for Republican State Senator James H. Walwork at 12 years old. While Christie was his high school class president, Wildstein was already trying to go pro with a controversial run for a seat on the county Republican committee. When Christie was written up in a local paper after a home run went so far it landed in a family swimming pool, Wildstein's controversial run as a 16-year-old committee member landed in the New York Times. And as Christie was getting his law degree, Wildstein was the mayor of their hometown in Livingston, New Jersey. People called Wildstein a disgrace, the worst mayor in history, and a liar. He was 25 years old. Many years later, Wildstein founded a political gossip site that had tremendous success. At first, I was surprised. Running a political gossip site, I would think, requires schmoozing at rallies, events, dinners, and that didn't sound like the lone wolf who worked the scorebooks by himself. Wildstein, in fact, didn't want anyone to know his name, even though he was in charge of the publication. So he went by a fake name, Wally Edge. And sources didn't know who Wildstein really was. His own employees didn't know his real name. He didn't show up anywhere in person or communicate by phone or by email, but instead, the recently deceased AOL Instant Messenger. He'd get scoops on major stories, develop relationships with some of the top government officials, and hired reporters that are now well-known national correspondents. When a governor before Christie had resigned, Wally Edge knew 20 minutes before anyone else. For those closely following Jersey politics, Wildstein's site was important. Christie was reported to have been a frequent reader. When Christie became governor, Wally Edge revealed who he really was. People couldn't believe it. They were expecting an established reporter that had gone rogue or a former politician with inside scoops, but this guy? The lone wolf had been secretly in the pack all along, just seated quietly behind a desk providing information or the information he wanted to provide to all of the players in New Jersey politics. 
So why did Wildstein reveal himself? Because he was appointed by newly installed Governor Chris Christie's senior representative at the Port Authority, Bill Baroni. Wildstein would serve as the agency's director of interstate capital projects, a job that was created for him. So this is a good time to meet Matt Katz. He's a journalist and a key player in Bridgegate, integral to this story. He literally wrote the book on Christie, titled America's Governor. It's a great read. And this is what he said when he first found out he was covering the Christie beat. I said, no, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to do the Christie, Christie beat. But I You was, had just uh, come back from I, Afghanistan, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought I was, you know, some hard-nosed, on-the-street reporter and didn't want to be hanging out with a bunch of suits in the state house. Matt got to know everyone while covering Christie, the governor himself and his staff, including Bill Baroni, the man that hired David Wildstein. Baroni himself is quite the character. Many, for years, have called him Phony Baroni, believing he's a ruthless political operative that will say anything. He sort of looks like Paul Ryan and speaks similarly to Rob Lowe in Parks and Recreation. He and Wildstein would oversee the New Jersey Port Authority. Baroni was technically Wildstein's boss. I mean, he wrote a book. Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. How to lose weight or yeah, something. About, about losing weight. Yeah. Uh, fat kid got fit and so can you. <laughs> and he wrote it with a uh, part-time soap opera actor who he had hired at the Port Authority for a ton of money as like a publications expert or something. Baroni hires Wildstein. But mm -hmm. it, it's safe to assume that Christie is overseeing this and is aware that Wildstein is hired, right or no? Oh, oh for sure. Uh, there, all, all my reporting indicated that A, um, hires of the Port Authority, which was such an important agency to execute the governor's political agenda, um, were all authorized by the, the front office, by, by Christie. And, um, I mean, this guy was hired without, without a resume <laughs> for a position that didn't exist. I think the bigger uh, value to Wildstein in Christie's mind was the, his experience in the dark political arts. Or as one writer put it, an encyclopedic knowledge of the Port Authority. The Port Authority was, in fact, created by Wildstein's idol, the real-life Wally Edge the name that Wildstein gave himself for all those years he operated his news site. The real life edge, born in 1873 and twice the governor of New Jersey, realized in the early 20th century that there was a lot of transportation that required the cooperation of New York and New Jersey. There are several bridges, tunnels, and commuter rails that start in one state and end in the other, not to mention airports, parks, and a wide range of other government properties that require both states to constantly coordinate. And thus, the real-life Wally Edge helped create the Port Authority, an independent governing body. The Port Authority, over time, became so powerful that it doesn't have to adhere to basic laws. It's not required to hand over even overtly relevant documents to most matters and has an operating budget larger than nine states. For New Jersey and New York, overseeing the Port Authority is an important job as there is a lot of money at stake. And as a result... There's a lot of high paying gigs. Many believe that Wildstein had a direct line to the governor, just as Jonah Hill did with Brad Pitt, which angered many. But this direct connection allowed Christie to get loads of information from a man that loved crunching the numbers. So much so that he couldn't help himself. I wanted you to see these player evaluations that you asked me to do. I asked you to do three. Yeah. To evaluate three players? Yeah. How many did you do? 47. Okay. Actually, 51. I don't know why I lied just then. The lone wolf would tell colleagues often that he, quote, had a constituency of one, the governor. Many considered Wildstein a spy for Christie, tapping phone calls and looking at others' emails. But in the interest of sticking to reality here, which is awfully hard to believe as you couldn't make this stuff up, the spying stuff and phone tapping remains speculation. But Wildstein and many others in this story are evidence as to why New Jersey has a, let's say, certain reputation. The Soprano State, as it's often called, has a long history of blatant political bribery, corruption, and scandal. One Jersey official said, politics in New Jersey is organized crime. 
said another Jersey politician, there will, quote, always be a corruption problem in New Jersey. That person was Chris Christie, a few years before becoming governor. Christie, like many before him, became focused, if not obsessed, with changing this narrative of New Jersey corruption, with him as the hero. As district attorney, Christie made this his priority. In 2006 and 2007, there wasn't another U.S. attorney who had more corruption convictions than Christie. Over 130 political officials were indicted. There wasn't one acquittal, not one. This helped clear his path to becoming the 53rd governor of New Jersey. He was the tough DA turned gov who planned on finally cleaning it all up. And he came out swinging. So obviously sleep is incredibly important, or at least I know it is for me. And there's sleep number beds. A sleep number bed lets you choose your ideal comfort and support on each side, which is amazing. It's perfect for couples, that's for sure. Uh, They're able to somehow sense every move and they automatically adjust so you can stay sleeping comfortable throughout the night. They even have an adjustment for snoring, which I find unbelievable. Sleep number beds cost about the same as traditional mattresses, last twice as long, and 91% of owners recommend them. Best of all, right now, queen mattresses start at only $899.99. You'll only find sleep number at any of the 550 sleep number stores nationwide. Visit sleepnumber.com to find the store near you. And be sure to tell them what really happened sent you. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Zarniak. I'm a sportscaster and I love sports. One of the things I love most about it is the adrenaline I feel. Whether I'm at a racetrack before a big race, on a football field before a big NFL game, on the court covering the NBA or at a baseball stadium, maybe covering hockey. But one thing that I also seem to find around those experiences is music. And music is the one thing I would say that I love just as much as sports. Hootie and the Blowfish getting back together. What's your expectation when y'all get out there? We just like to have fun, man. They ain't rocket science. We're not trying to, you know, reinvent the wheel. We're just going to give them Hootie and the Blowfish, man. And that's what we're going to do. Make sure that you subscribe to my new podcast called Players. Go to applepodcastradio.com. Players with Lindsay Zarniak. Find it wherever you can get your podcasts. So I was in Los Angeles and I was meeting with a Celtics fan, which is bizarre because I'm not the biggest LA guy and I can't stand the Celtics. Go Knicks. Yeah, I said it. But this guy's also a great documentary filmmaker. And we were talking about moving from documentary filmmaking to documentary podcasts. It's interesting because you no longer have any sort of visual that you're working with. This guy's name is Gotham Chopra and you probably know him and I love it. I love, really love his new podcast, Why Sports Matter. Like our show, it really dives into larger stories that we so often overlook. So at the end of today's episode of What Really Happened, we're going to play a portion of Why Sports Matter about Sadie in the Woods, only because I really think it gets you thinking and it's worth your time, which, trust me, I know is valuable. Back to the show. Governor Christie caught my eye, and really the public at large, quicker than any prior Jersey governor. In fact, the last I recalled, the governor of New Jersey was Jim McGreevy. He had made his mark as the first openly gay governor in United States history. The problem was he only came out after it was revealed that he had given his secret lover a homeland security job that he had zero qualifications for. I won't say this again, but you really can't make most of the stuff up. I really have worked hard on this episode to stick to the facts, and I do, except at the very end, which I'll call out, but the facts in this story just happen to have an incredible level of entertainment value which, as you'll see, is a real problem. Matt Katz is hugely responsible for documenting just how Christie grew to national prominence. If you're the governor of the 11th biggest state and you're an afterthought in the New York City media market and you want to run for president and you have a big personality and know how to talk in front of the camera, you need a way of getting yourself out there. And what his team did so well was go to his town hall uh, meetings and his press conferences and immediately find the two or three snippets uh, that would play well nationally, either because they uh, dealt with the national issue or because they 
um, featured a way of talking that I guess before the current president would have been quite quite unusual for a politician because yeah. they, they seem blunt and aggressive. And this taxpayer-funded team would, would be sitting in the back of the room cutting clips and then um, putting them together into, into an email blast. With short sound bites that could be neatly packaged, showing a governor that cared but also had this temper, Christie was perfect for those wanting a quick fix of political entertainment. Glenn Beck called it conservative porn. Some highlights? I'm going to say things directly. When you ask me questions, I'm going to answer them directly, straightly, bluntly. And nobody in New Jersey is going to have to wonder where I am on an issue. Um, And I think they've had enough of politicians who make them wonder. Because you know most of the time why they make them wonder, Tom? They make them wonder so they got an escape hatch. So they have an escape hatch. And I'm not interested in the escape hatch. I came here to govern. Christie's team saw the attention that they were getting. And so they kept expanding the team, hiring videographers and professional lighters for each town hall. It became a bit of an act, Christie coming out to the same song, flipping his jacket to the side. And despite many giving him flack for it being a bit too shticky, I'd suggest it's politics. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was, with his social media team in the, in the back of the room, cutting clips of... Uh, of what he said at the town hall meeting. By the time I got back to the newsroom to write out my story, uh, Christie had already created the narrative through his own media operation. And where were those clips going? Into an email blast that it took many years, and we actually had to sue to find out who he was sending this yeah. email blast to. But it wasn't just New Jersey political reporters giving a rundown of what happened that day. Team Christie then created a list of over 25,000 journalists, columnists, TV producers, you name it, to send these videos to. And it wasn't just a long list, it was broken up into national columnists, traditional and conservative media, Sunday show producers, each cable news booker for each time slot, in addition to Spanish language outlets. Where the town halls were conducted was also precise. Christie's deputy chief of staff, Bill Stepien, otherwise known as Smoke, created the T-100 list. This had data for Smoke to use in sorting out where Christie needed votes for re-election. Thus, all of those town halls captured on YouTube for national attention were serving an equally important component for local attention, all using the T-100. And then there was a third list with another, frankly awesome title, the TK-1 list. This was, according to Katz, 1,000 of the most important people in New Jersey, local politicians, priests, high school football coaches, and the guy who owned the shoe store on Main Street for the last 40 years. Christie's people weren't just making sure the videos in the town halls would play well nationally. They were making sure that the town halls were in the right communities and making sure that the communities had the right people attending. He basically had his own TV station, and what he was sending out, the, the video clips lacking context off, often, um, that he was sending out was already on cable news. And um, we, were then, we were then following it and had to kind of report on that, but also try to provide some more context and also uh, report on what we thought was, was news. But we were often playing catch-up and Christie was able to dominate the narrative. Christie was doing a good job of communicating with politicians, constituents, and the media. Whether or not he was actually getting anything done is really not the point because his messaging was strong. A straight shooter that takes action. His approval rating was 73%. Quickly, people started talking about him as a presidential candidate. Roger Ailes had dinner with the governor, reportedly fell hard for Christie. The governor was then invited to a breakfast at the Racket and Tennis Club in Manhattan where dozens of millionaires, billionaires, and some of the most powerful people in the world asked Christie to run for president. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger stood up and said that he had known nearly a dozen presidents in his life and that, quote, being a president is about two things, courage and character. You have both, he said. President Obama's team started doing opposition research. And then... There were the voters, demanding that Christie run. When giving a speech at the Reagan Library, a woman stood and said this to the governor. I say this from the bottom of my heart, from my daughter who's right here and my grandchildren who are at home. I know New Jersey needs you, but I really implore you. I really do. Emma, this isn't funny. I mean this with all my heart. We can't wait another four years 
to, tw to, to 2016. And I, I really implore you to, as a citizen of this country, to please, sir, to reconsider. Not, don't even say anything tonight, of course you wouldn't. Go home and really think about it. <laughs> Please. Do it, do it for my daughter. Do it for our grandchildren. Do it for our sons. Please, sir, don't. We need you. Your country needs you to run for president. As she gets emotional, the packed auditorium is now rising to their feet. A standing ovation continues. We aren't just in Jersey now. This is at the library of the most popular Republican president in the modern era. But Christie said he wasn't ready, and he said it a million times. No way. Not gonna happen. I'm not running. I'm 100% certain I'm not gonna run. I don't wanna run. I don't feel like I'm ready to run. I don't want it that badly. You have to believe in your heart and in your soul and in your mind that you are ready, and I don't believe that about myself right now. But yeah, why didn't he run in 2012? I don't think he thought he could beat Obama. Mm-hmm. I, I think if he, he, he flirted with it so much that if he really didn't think he was ready, he knew he wasn't ready. I think he simply made a cold political calculation that he could not beat uh, an incumbent president. So Mitt Romney became the nominee. Christie, according to him, opted to get more experience. According to others, he opted to try and win his second term by a landslide. He or his staff did almost everything they could to get endorsements from many of New Jersey's mayors. Wildstein was known to use his power, benefiting from the extensive catalogs that Smoke had put together, both the TK1 and T100 lists. Christie was, as anybody would, enjoying the national press. He was this bipartisan, Republican in a Democratic state, straight shooting, don't make fun of me because I'm overweight, governor. He was beloved. The press would even talk about how President Obama didn't have the Republicans and Democrats working together like Christie had. He got to do all sorts of cool things. Having double dates with Howard Stern and his wife, Matt Lauer and his wife, partying late in the night with George Clooney, dancing with Jamie Foxx in the Hamptons and crashing that same night at Bon Jovi's place. After an official trip to Israel, the Jordanian army flew Christie and his family to party with King Abdullah by the Red Sea and at night rode ATVs through the Wadi Run, a famous desert, the night ending with Bono and Christie singing Hotel California together. I even found an old radio clip of Christie recounting the experience. Three. Probably a top three. Top three other than my, my wedding and the birth of my children. Top three. Wedding, kids. Bono. Bono. Yeah. That that's a moment. That's a moment. That's a top ten. Uh, totally. Top I'm three. Fine. So excited that he scoffed at the following question and broke out into song. Oh, no. We both knew the lyrics. Come on. It's one of those songs. Ow, please. There were voices down the corridor. I thought I heard them say, welcome to the Hotel Cat. And now we get to the juicy part, the traffic. Bridget Ann Kelly is a mother of four, grew up in New Jersey, and is Chris Christie's deputy chief of staff. Kelly took over the deputy position for Bill Stepien, a.k.a. Smoke, as he was now heading up the governor's re-election campaign. In mid-August of 2013, Kelly called an operative to see if Mayor Mark was endorsing Christie. No, she heard back. The next morning, the lone wolf got a message from Kelly. Time for some traffic problems in Fort Lee. Wildstein wrote back one minute later. Got it. It turns out the group decided to wait a few weeks to start the traffic. Why? They wanted the havoc to commence on the first day of school. So about three weeks later on a Sunday night, Wildstein started to inform people of a traffic study to begin the next morning on the George Washington Bridge. It's been said that nothing turns Wildstein on like New Jersey traffic. Everyone informed seems to think this is a bad idea, a very bad idea. They're also confused as to who is ordering this, but the lone wolf shuts down any concerns. It's happening. The common belief is that Wildstein has that direct line to the governor. And as Wildstein is preparing, Christie isn't anywhere close. In fact, he's in Texas, standing on the sidelines, watching the Cowboys play the New York Giants. The study requires the closing of several lanes, and thus, traffic commences on a Monday morning. Less than 90 minutes into the lanes being closed, traffic is clearly much worse than usual, and 911 calls are coming in at a fast pace. Many of these calls are coming from Fort Lee, the town in which the lane closures most severely impact. 
So now meet Mark Sokolich, the mayor of Fort Lee, who didn't endorse Chris Christie for re-election. I'm going to call him Mayor Mark because his last name is too easy to mispronounce. But not only did Mayor Mark live in Fort Lee all of his life, but he was literally raised by the community after both his father and mother died within one year of each other when he was 13 years old. He said, quote, Fort Lee treated me like a surrogate son. He loves his town. He was a town council member for four years before becoming mayor, is a Rotary Club member. He even founded the Fort Lee Flag Football Association. Mayor Mark is sincerely proud. After a bit of digging around on YouTube, you can find citizen videos that have been posted through the years. And sure enough, at some point, you'll see Mayor Mark happens to be there, no matter how big or small the event is. On Veterans Day, we're very proud here in Fort Lee. Christmas Eve, and that's why I'm so proud of this community. And he almost cries when talking about the state government doing anything that would impact his town. Do not involve the people in Fort Lee who I have sworn my life to protect and to make sure that um, that I've sworn to make sure the quality of their lives is the highest it can be, and their health, safety, and welfare is always preserved. Because at the end of the day, that's my most important responsibility as the mayor of this town. And just to give you an idea of how small Fort Lee really is, despite becoming the reason for all of this happening in the first place, the mayoral job is a part-time gig. The town isn't big enough for a full-time mayor. So Mayor Mark is confused and starts reaching out to the Port Authority, but gets no response. But he doesn't start reaching out to the press or cause too big of a commotion, even though traffic is backed up for miles. Why? Well, more on that soon. So what is normally a 30-minute ride from Fort Lee to Midtown Manhattan is now taking three hours. People are missing work, appointments, and it's also the first day of school. So busloads of kids literally are going stir-crazy. It's nuts. Wildstein has a police lieutenant drive him near the bridge to take a tour of the traffic, enjoying his masterpiece. People from all over are demanding answers, but Wildstein ignores them. He says to his team, go radio silent. He then takes a break at a diner. Meanwhile, during the first night of traffic, over 3,000 miles away at a swanky fundraiser in Arizona, Christie is still getting questions about one day becoming president. Nothing about traffic. It's now Tuesday. Traffic again hobbles the biggest bridge in America. Christie is back in Jersey doing a CBS Sunday morning special, which is titled Chris Christie, a fighter from Jersey. Now, it'd be unfair to say that all he was doing was a CBS special. I assume he could govern at the same time. But my point is that all signs indicated Christie is on his way. He'll be the shoe in 2016 Republican presidential candidate. Mayor Mark is texting and calling Bill Baroni, but Baroni isn't responding at all. Instead, Baroni passes along Mayor Mark's emails pleading for help to Wildstein, who forwards them on to Kelly, who then says, quote, is it wrong that I'm smiling? Wildstein responds, no. And Kelly says, I feel badly for the kids. And then waits a minute before adding, I guess. It's now Wednesday, three days into the traffic jam and the anniversary of 9-11. Christie is at the memorial service in Manhattan. He is photographed in a group of three, chatting and laughing. The other two people, Wildstein and Baroni. Wildstein would later say that he was updating the gov on the traffic and the governor would say he didn't recall this. Baroni would later say that he and Wildstein were, quote, bragging about it to Christie, who at some point apparently gave Wildstein the nickname Mr. Wolf, a Pulp Fiction reference to the character that was otherwise known as the Fixer. Any issues, Mr. Wolf would take care of it. I guess my whole lone wolf nickname wasn't so far off. On Thursday is when it seems this story goes from being something few of us would ever know about to a national scandal. And it happens because of one man, a guy one former reporter and Christie aide called a effing muck. Meet John Chachowski, otherwise known as the Road Warrior. The Road Warrior is a New Jersey journalist that writes, among other things, a column titled The Road Warrior. I checked many of his articles and accompanying videos over the years, and John, in his 50s, is hard not to like. He's hard not to love. He mostly reports on Jersey traffic, issues with the roads, and complaints by locals about anything from a new traffic light that isn't working correctly to the wait time for a pedestrian walkway that is longer than one would expect. He travels quite a bit to what many would consider obscure and random parts of the state. He seems to film most of the videos himself on his iPhone, providing commentary as he shoots. If he has the resources, it seems sometimes another person comes along and films. 
John is precise in his reporting. I found myself late one night watching the road warrior as he spoke for two whole minutes about a small orange light positioned on a pole about five feet high saying that, quote, it's an odd beacon located on the median of Route 287 at milepost 50.4 in Kinelon. He then goes on to question why it was there. The road warrior isn't messing around. So for me, this is the perfect meal. Omaha Steaks. I had a few friends over the other night. We were watching a show and everyone kind of went, they thought I was an amazing cook, which is certainly not the case. It was in fact Omaha Steaks. Uh, They're also great gifts, actually. Uh, You can use them for the holidays that are obviously, you know, coming up and they are delicious. For only $49.99, you can get my family gift pack. Uh, If you go to omahasteaks.com, which I highly suggest, omahasteaks.com, and enter my code, it's only my code, WRH, in the search bar, you get 75% off, which I actually thought was a typo because that's a lot of money. 75% off for Omaha Steaks, which again, are absolutely delicious. People now think that I am a good cook. Uh, So right now, for my listeners only, Omaha Steaks is giving this exclusive savings. And to be clear, because we are about facts, listen to everything that you're going to get for less than $50. Two filet mignons, two top sirloins, two boneless pork chops, four boneless chicken breasts, four kielbasa sausages, four burgers, four potatoes au gratin, four caramel apple tartlets, and then one Omaha Steaks seasoning packet. Plus, you're going to get four additional kielbasa sausages free. All of that. Literally unbelievable. It's at omahasteaks.com. Just enter my code WRH. And again, I thought it was a typo, but you get 75% savings off. I'm not making that up. It's 75% savings off. It's a hit if you want to have some friends over, if you want it for yourself, or if you're giving it out as a gift. So it's the fourth day of traffic, Thursday. The road warrior has been hearing about this jam. He's getting calls and emails and hearing from others that he works with. Somebody from the New York side of the Port Authority, which has beef with the Jersey side of the Port Authority, also lets him know about it, under the condition of anonymity. So Road Warrior emails a spokesperson at the Port Authority asking about the traffic. It's the first media inquiry into the lane closures. The Port Authority, obliged to respond to a reporter opposed to a mayor, responds saying it was a traffic study and that they had been in contact with the Fort Lee mayor and police. Both lies. This response turns into a memo that the Port Authority puts out to its top employees. Higher-ups at the New York side of the Port Authority find this incident strange. People within the agency start asking questions as to what's going on. The road warrior also reaches out to Mayor Mark and asks him what's going on. I feel like I'd be, you know, throwing off missiles at that point. Like, it gets to Wednesday or Thursday for the mayor of Fort Lee to really step up and and say anything. I've never understood that. Trenton holds a lot of uh, a lot of power. By Trenton, Katz means the governor's office. And um, the idea that you can like call up a, a local reporter and bitch about something that you think the government in New Jersey is doing and not expect retribution for that, um, I think uh, is 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 something that local politicians don't believe. They they are worried that right. retribution. Um, can come back to them in New Jersey politics. They consider the most powerful governorship in the country, and there's a ton of towns, 535, and, you know, I mean, there's cases of guys complaining to um, their local paper, local weekly paper about something the administration did early on, and then, you know, hearing from somebody in the governor's office immediately and, and getting what's, what was perceived as threats. And so the mayor responds gently, quote, I've asked the Port Authority for an explanation, but they haven't responded. I thought we had a good relationship. Now I'm beginning to wonder if there's something I did wrong. Am I being sent some sort of message? It seems as if the mayor is hinting that this traffic study, and really a traffic nightmare, is actually retribution. The mayor didn't endorse the governor, and the gov's people had sought his endorsement. Was this payback? The mayor is clearly the poor kid who the class bully just punched in the face. And the mayor, this 
kid that's getting picked on doesn't even want to get back up. Lying on the ground, he just wants to make sure and check to see if it's okay to get back up. And if he does, is there something he could do so that he doesn't get punched again? And I'm not dramatizing it. I'm just wrapping my head around how this is quite literally third grade style diplomacy. The mayor then, and I'm now picturing him on the ground, asks the road warrior to please print this. I'm always proud and pleased with this administration. He continues, is there a punitive overtone here? Is there something we should have done? I I just don't know. The following day, Friday, the road warrior writes another column with more questions. The road warrior finishes the column giving some advice to the mayor, quote, you never know when the next quote unquote study might fall on you like a huge net and imprison everybody around you for miles, unquote. The road warrior is like the school newspaper writer, suggesting to the bullied mayor that everyone in school knows, even though Christie is punching the mayor in his face, that if the mayor dares to speak up, Christie will only punch back that much harder. That's how things worked. The traffic ends on Friday. Too many questions are being asked. With the exception of a Wall Street Journal report, the story seems to be kept at bay. Nearly two months later, on November 5th, Christie wins big. And in his victory speech, he clearly has his sights set on the White House. I know that if we can do this in Trenton, New Jersey, maybe the folks in Washington, D.C. should tune in their TVs right now, see how it's done. And then on November 21st, in a five-store resort in Scottsdale, Arizona, Christie is celebrated as the new chairman of the National Republican Governors Association. National TV reporters continue to ask, despite only just being reelected, if he is preparing for 2016. Matt Katz admits he's so caught up in Christie becoming a national figure that he forgets to ask the Gov about the jam, at least on this day. During the same week, back in Jersey, Phony Baroni goes to the state assembly to clean things up. Many in Christie's camp look at this as their best chance to squash the whole thing. But the hearing, which I've now watched a few times, literally feels like a scene out of Parks and Recreation. Baroni is talking about the traffic study as if it's an investigation into a very complicated, intricate foreign operation. He takes out a blown up map placed on cardboard that's nice and shiny and with a red marker traces where the four lanes were that had been closed. It's hard to take him seriously when he says, quote, let's be honest with each other. It created some traffic in Fort Lee, unquote. As if he's the one who's being upfront and transparent. Despite the hearing somehow proceeding in a mild-mannered tone, a Jersey Assemblywoman can't take it anymore. I'm sorry, Mr. Baroni. I heard you the first three times that you talked about the issue of whether or not there should be lanes. But so, that's not what this hearing is about. This hearing is about the lack of communication and the poor conduct of the Port Authority. You and you are here trying to cover that up. There's what no, I would uh, like to know is whether or not you have an nonsense. email trail. You're trying to tell us that this major a study that had a major disruption on your major bridge has no paper trail, that there is not a single email that explains how this was done. Assemblywoman, I, that defies I have all logic, here. and nobody in this room believes that. In Christie and his camp's attempt to squash this whole incident, politicians and the media left feeling like this study was instead some serious hogwash. So finally, on December 2nd, Nearly three months after the traffic jam, and in his first press conference at the state capitol after winning re-election, Christie is asked about Bridgegate. The question comes from Matt Katz. I worked the cones, actually, Uh, Matt. Unbeknownst to everybody, I was actually the guy out there. I was in overalls and a hat, so I wasn't, but I actually was the guy working the cones out there. You really are not serious with that question. Despite mocking Matt, the governor seemed to realize that he had to hold others accountable he needed to do something. Four days after Christie said he wasn't working those cones, Wildstein was told to resign. Christie issued a statement, thanking the lone wolf for being a tireless advocate and grateful for his commitment and dedication. Six days after that, on December 12th, Baroni was forced out too. About a month later, on January 9th, Christie apparently finds out about Bridget Ann Kelly's time for traffic problems in Fort Lee email. He fires her and then holds an epic press conference. If Baroni couldn't fix it, and Christie's sarcastic answer didn't help, Christie took questions until there were none left. It went on for 108 minutes. Christie said he was disappointed in what transpired, but he had nothing to hide. 
When watching videos of the news afterwards, most political pundits agreed that Christie made the right move. The Gov was sticking to his brand. He wasn't afraid of anything or of any questions. But it was too late. The same day, the lone wolf was going to federal law enforcement, saying there was no traffic study. He'd tell them more, so long as they didn't put him in jail. The FBI told the governor's office the day after the press conference that they had already started a criminal investigation. Subpoenas were being handed out, the New Jersey U.S. attorney was running a probe, the Manhattan district attorney and a U.S. Senate committee was investigating, state senators and assemblymen were calling for even more inquiries. Democrats were now spending millions of dollars on opposition research, as Christie was still considered the frontrunner for the 2016 presidential election. Before Team Christie knew it, upwards of 20 reporters were covering this story full-time. It was tasty for reporters to unravel this counter-narrative, the guy who was going to tell it how it is became the guy who won't even tell you the truth about traffic. It was hard to miss the story. Everyone from Rachel Maddow, who thought the bridge was a metaphor for anything that was wrong with the world, to Rush Limbaugh, once a man in love with Christie and who no longer had his back, were covering this nonstop. And when Maddow and Rush agree on not liking the same person, you know you're in trouble. Oftentimes, Christie found himself bunkered inside the governor's mansion with lifelong allies asking, even pleading, for them to be honest with them. Meanwhile, Wildstein was serving as the government's star witness. And prosecutors gave him a slap on the wrist. He was sentenced to three years probation and 500 hours of community service. He was also fined $10,000 and prohibited from seeking or accepting employment with any government agency. In exchange, he handed over 900 pages of emails, texts, and documents. He is, after all, a statistician. He said several people knew what was happening, including Smoke, the creator of TK1 and T100 lists, as well as Governor Christie. Before exiting the Port Authority, Wildstein also left with Baroni's computer. On September 19th, 2016, the trial began. Wildstein's deal with the prosecution meant he never had to say anything other than when he pled the fifth. My question is, does page 751 contain communications dated August 5th? 2013. Um, on the advice of counsel, I again uh, assert my right to remain silent. Okay. And that document uh, refers to a meeting with uh, Port Authority Chairman David Sampson, does it not? Uh, on the advice of counsel, I assert my right to remain silent. And that also refers to a meeting with the governor of the same date. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on the advice of counsel, I assert my right to remain silent. That's all that we have ever heard of his voice. To this day, in so many ways, we still have no idea who Wally Edge really is. In fact, it's impossible to see or hear anything from the trial. Says Katz. Each court is is different, and uh, New Jersey is particularly strict, to yeah. the point where um, you, we reporters can't even use the internet in the courtroom and had to get written permission from the judge to even bring a laptop in and one day i was actually the one day they they thought i was looking at facebook Mm -hmm. and they confiscated my computer searched it and um, kicked me out of the proceedings for the rest of the of the day and then they gave me a special seat (laughs) closer to the security that i had to sit in for the remainder of the trial (laughs) that's how bad it is The result of the trial? Bridget Kelly, the mother of four and Christie's deputy chief of staff, is sentenced to 18 months in jail. Bill Baroni, our fast-talking, let's be truthful, Christie aide, is sentenced to two years in jail. The judge said his additional six months in comparison to Kelly was due to that fateful testimony he gave when trying to squash the idea that this was all about retribution. To me, it seems like Kelly got a bad deal in all of this. Yeah, she sent some mean emails and was certainly aware of what this traffic was all about, but she didn't have the same power as the others. She didn't plan all of this. She was the messenger. And then when the governor did his supposedly uh, independent investigation of this, she was the one who was slut-shamed, and her actions were attributed to the fact that she had broken up recently with Christie's former campaign manager and was you know, trying to get in his good graces or something. So she's been 
punished many times over even before she sees the inside of a jail cell. Katz uses the term slut-shamed because speculation is, and it's only speculation, that Kelly had emailed Time for Traffic Problems in Fort Lee around the time she and Smoke broke up. Mayor Mark was also forced to take the stand. He admitted that he lied when he insisted in a letter to a New Jersey newspaper that the George Washington Bridge lane closures were in an act of political payback because he, quote, was petrified of further retribution from Governor Christie. He said, My responsibility is the safety of my community. We had a billion-dollar redevelopment that took 40 years to get off the ground. We were finally in the middle of it. I was petrified of further retribution. After scouring for tape of Mayor Mark, I tracked down a video on YouTube from a local town hall he gave after Bridgegate. The video itself is wobbly and only has 95 views, but in it, Mayor Mark says he purposely didn't do anything while the traffic was happening. At that point, I never said anything. You know, the press ran along with it. Rachel Maddow was dealing with it. Loretta Weinberg was dealing with it. MSNBC devoted, you know, 90% of their their airtime to the issue. Um, I was contacted by, when I tell you a million, I don't think that was an exaggeration, a million different media outlets for a comment, for an interview, for this, for that, and I refused. And I'm sharing this story with you because I wanted to tell you why I refused. I refused because at that time, I did not think that there was any benefit whatsoever to Borough of Fort Lee for me to intervene in this issue. I just didn't think it would help us at all. If there was some benefit that our community, you, I, us, if we can derive from it, I would have been out there that morning screaming and yelling on top of a pedestal saying, woe is me, look what happened. But I didn't view it to be any benefit. And I just allowed people just to run with the issue. But we knew in Fort Lee what had happened right away. He knew all along what was happening, but he admits it was too dangerous to speak up. But I grinned when I heard Mayor Mark say this later on in the town hall. Wolf Blitzer asked me a question. I forget what it was. And my answer was, you know, Fort Lee has a billion dollar redevelopment going on. And he kind of looked at me like, what does that have to do with the question that I just asked you? (laughs) The idea was to just keep talking about it so no one would dare mess with us. Mayor Mark is saying months after the lanes were closed and he had to finally speak up, he would always find ways to talk about issues facing his town even when they made zero sense to the national press. And according to him, this made a difference. And I think that to a certain extent, bringing attention to those initiatives while we were getting all of this national attention helped us in that regard. Unlike the others, Christie was never asked to go to court and will probably never know how much he knew about those lane closures. There was no physical evidence that proved Christie knew. There had been 12 text messages that seemed related to testimony on the closings, but they were deleted before anyone could read them. A grand jury unanimously said he wasn't guilty. Although one juror also told Bloomberg News, quote, in my opinion, that Governor Christie is a master puppeteer and was aware of everything. What we do know is that Christie was photographed with Wildstein and Baroni on day three of the traffic jams. We know that even if they weren't high school friends, they seemed to admire each other later on in life when Wildstein revealed that he had been Wally Edge. It even turns out that Christie once brought Wildstein to the third floor of the State House to show the fake Wally Edge a portrait of his idol, the real Wally Edge. Did Christie do wrong? It certainly seems like it. But why do we have to hate Chris Christie? Why do outlets and publications poke so much fun of his weight? Yeah, Christie can obviously handle the headlines. That's not really my point. If anything, he used it to his political advantage, but I'm not talking about him. It's about kids that want to run for office who are fat or don't look perfect and now aren't running for anything at all. They won't even raise their hand in the classroom. That's the problem. And maybe it's not being fat so much as they have a stutter or are too skinny or have too many freckles or don't have a cool cell phone. That's the larger problem. Maybe I'm being too sensitive, but I disagree. Meet that overweight kid and understand what she or he is capable of and maybe I am not being so sensitive. And it's not the looks. Why did political opponents have to slam Christie so hard when he misused a government helicopter to go see his son play baseball in high school? Yeah, it makes for a sexy headline. He ended up paying the state back, although it did take a while. But was it really that big of a story? If so, I see a governor trying to be a dad at the same time. A dad that was himself a baseball high school star and wanted to see his kid do the same. I'm not going to make it front cover news or start issuing public statements. If I were Chris Christie's son on that day... 
I'd say shit. My dad hardly comes to my games because of work, and he just got a hold of a chopper to come and see me play. That's my dad. That's pretty cool. I think Christy is in the wrong on Bridgegate. Way in the wrong. But I don't hate him for it. It just seems, somewhere along the way, a guy with good intentions lost sight. This will seem unrelated at first, but at a recent Fast Company Innovation Festival, Hall of Famer and Yankee legend Derek Jeter said this. This is a business. You're learning that. I think when you first come up as, a, as an athlete or as a professional athlete, when you're younger, you're just playing a game, right? And then the longer you play, you realize that this is starting to become a business. So there's, mm-hmm. there's uh, you know, some things that uh, at times aren't unpopular or are not popular, but, um, you know, it's part of a business. Mm-hmm. What Jeter said about going pro actually made me think of Chris Christie. In grade school, through high school, sometimes even into college, a young athlete loves the game. But then at some point it becomes a business and the love of it all is usually forced to coming second. Sometimes it's entirely drained out of the system. It kind of sucks. What really happened with Christie is interesting, but I'll always want to know how it happened. The kid who showed up to town halls, the MVP that was willing to come off the bench, the kid who wrote the local town paper when he thought classmates were being treated poorly, the class president through high school into college then turns into a guy who would close a bridge to get back at a mayor whose town is so small that it's not even a full-time gig. When or for how long does that change in character take place? The New Jersey courts say that the case is now shut unless something else magically appears. And mark my words, maybe it won't be for many years, but I have a sense that something may magically appear. There were reports that an elderly woman passed away because it took ambulances too long to reach her. But even her daughter said they were only delayed by a matter of minutes and it wouldn't have made a difference. Christie's public downfall to the least liked governor in America can be attributed to many things, but Bridgegate was instrumental. For me, this story is more than that. Bridgegate really damaged people's lives in serious ways. It did represent an abuse in power that can't be condoned. You can't play God with it. With that said, nobody died. Nobody was wrongfully incarcerated. Nobody lost the right to vote. A few people in power with an agenda and most likely a governor decided it was okay to cause havoc for a political opponent. It's too bad that, and I realize this is outlandish, but that the traffic jam happened not over the Hudson River, but instead somewhere around Camden, New Jersey, one of the roughest inner cities in the state. There, the country and the world would see the desperate lives many are forced to live. A growing murder rate, homelessness, and a mental health epidemic. Perhaps all of this best summarized by a young man from Camden. When asked on 9-11 if he was afraid, responded with, I'm not afraid, because if the terrorists fly over Camden, they'll think they have done it already. But it wasn't Camden. And so while the politicians, policymakers, and media were spending months and years on Bridgegate, and a phony traffic study, the people of New Jersey were forgotten. Maybe for Wildstein, a.k.a. Jonah Hill, a.k.a. Wally Edge, a.k.a. The Wolf or Mr. Wolf, this was the outcome he kind of hoped for in the beginning. In the political circles and Jersey history that he fantasized about, Wildstein is now a known figure responsible for an historic scandal. He's no longer just an anonymous blogger. His real name is in the history books. And so the lone wolf is now back in the woods, where he now resides in a mansion in Florida. And he's looking good, too. He's lost 30 plus pounds and sports a hip pair of glasses. He's starting to take to Twitter. And I'd bet now that he's again alone, it's a matter of time until we hear from him. When nobody's looking, including the head of the pack, is when the lone wolf likes to make his attack. I reached out to him on Twitter, asked if he'd follow me back, which he did within hours. I then asked if we could speak and I got no response. I asked again. Wildstein responded asking for my contact information, which I gave, and he said he'd reach out. I haven't heard anything since. And this is exactly what I'd expect from the lone wolf. He's right there, following me on Twitter, with my email and cell phone in his Rolodex, listening, monitoring, and waiting. And finally, last but not least, is John Chachowski, our road warrior who now three years later, since noticing traffic issues on the George Washington Bridge, continues to travel around New Jersey. Matt Katz told me this. 
this whole story is a testament to local journalism because none of this would have gotten out there if it wasn't for the tenacity of local reporters. While nearly everyone in this story, from reporters to politicians, have sought higher office or higher profile jobs, John has kept at it. John doesn't shout opinions inside a cozy studio, nor yell breaking news 10 times in an hour. He certainly doesn't have any sought after guests. But he'd tell you different. The Road Warrior would tell you that he has the Jersey Streets as his studio, and he has the best guests, for they are the citizens of New Jersey. Give John an iPhone or a pad and pen, and off he goes. He's not looking to be a star. In fact, he wouldn't even come on this podcast and give me five minutes to ask him some questions, or at the very least, thank him for his reporting. I'm not going to start dropping names, but we've talked to some, for different episodes and uh, of this podcast, we've talked to some pretty high-profile people. We have tried reaching out to the road warrior and cannot get in contact with him. He's like, he doesn't, he doesn't want the press. I mean, he's just, on, is he on, on the ground? Is he busy? Do you, you know, I was, I was, as, you, as you say that, like we never, I don't think we've ever had him on the air either, which means we probably, <laughs> we probably couldn't get him either. <laughs> kind of adds to his mystique, doesn't it? Yeah, no, that's what I'm thinking. It's like, maybe, maybe we just won't interview him. Maybe, maybe, and I, I I'm, this is going to come across, you know, a bit tongue in cheek, but maybe that's how it should be. That let let the local reporter who does the traffic column be on the streets where he belongs, writing what what should be uh, reported on. Yeah. My opinion, Christy knew. I can nearly picture it, and I'm stereotyping, but that's what makes this all the more worse. What Christie did was double down the awful characterization of the New Jersey politician that he was so proud to say wasn't him. My picture is of him ordering the bridge closing by the same way a mobster orders a beatdown or a killing in a movie, by never actually saying yes, in a badass sort of way. Sick and disturbing, perhaps I'm making light of it, but badass nonetheless. The consigliere, in this case a woman of four who's about to be slut-shamed, asks if the Gov wants to make the hit. The lone wolf is waiting for the green light. In the back of the black car, the Gov looks out the window. The shadows of the trees perfectly fall on his face. You can hear a light breeze. Maybe they're driving near the Hudson River. He looks out on the waves. You know, he wasn't a kid too long ago. A kid with the family on the Jersey Shore. But it's not time for that. Not right now. The Gov sighs. It's time for something else and he knows it. The Gov turns his head away from the window and makes eye contact with the consigliere. He holds a beat longer than usual and then looks back out of the window. That is the yes. That is the green light. That extra beat of silence gives Bridget Kelly the green light to tell Wildstein, who then tells Baroni, and then by Monday morning, forget about it. That's how I see it. And I bet, legally speaking, that's how Christie did it and why he was never in court, not once. Don't forget, he is a lawyer, and he knows how the system works. The Gov never actually said the words, okay, do it. In fact, he didn't even put the plan in place, but he set a culture, a culture that was so defined and so ruthless that words weren't necessary. A culture in which it takes about two seconds to realize the lone wolf is the one who Kelly would call on to execute this madness, because only a lone wolf can be given a job that didn't exist until he arrived. Only a lone wolf can come out of the woods without a resume and get the $250,000 gig. Only David Wildstein. With that said, only a local traffic reporter could have helped unravel this. Only local reporters. Without the Road Warrior, I really don't know if I would be sitting here right now talking about Bridgegate and asking what really happened. So I've taken a position on this episode, but I really do need your feedback and your insight. Maybe I'm close, but could use some additional details that you're aware of. Maybe I'm misunderstanding elements of nuance in this story, or maybe I have the whole thing wrong. If you have information as to what really happened, please call 347-674-6980. That's 347-674-6980. Or you can email us by going to our website, jenkspod.com. I'm available on Twitter at Andrew Jenks. 
We also reached out to Governor Christie's camp and never heard back, so this invitation obviously and sincerely includes them. What Really Happened is produced by Dwayne Johnson, Danny Garcia, Seven Bucks Productions, in association with Cadence 13 Studios. Britney Spears shaved her head. She held a baseball bat and smashed a car. She began wearing wigs. Videos surfaced of her yelling at cameras and talking in languages that nobody could understand. The people and the press ate it up. The perfect girl was finally breaking down. This was a year that will define her public profile. Two months later, in February 2008, Britney Spears lost legal control of her life, and now, 10 years later, she is still managed, some would say controlled, by a conservatorship, a legal concept normally applied to those with mental limitations or old age. But did Britney really have a quote-unquote meltdown? What does a conservatorship really mean? Is any of it real? In this story, it's hard to define what real even is. But we'll try, because we want to know what really happened.